A.W. Tozer tells us that man's highest aspirations are fulfilled through the revealed truth of God's Word. We have been learning what the Lord Jesus Christ has fulfilled for us through His incarnation and as the pioneer of our salvation, how He makes it possible for other human beings to share in divine glory. He has shared in our experience of being human and because of His solidarity, we have become sons and daughters of God. The goal of His incarnation was to defeat death. He took flesh and blood to put an end to the devil's work. Today we are liberated from the fear of death. In the crucified and risen Christ, God confronts evil with love and deception with truth. He loved us so He died for us and conquered death. He has given us the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth and thus protecting us from the deception of Satan. We shall all look at our high priest who through self-atonement restored a relationship marred by sin. His death not only purifies us from sin, but also delivered us from divine rot. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Through the Bible. It's good to be back with you, dear friend. This is Through the Bible. Thank you for tuning in. In our previous study, we had closed with this information. We noted, or rather took note, how the author perfects us through suffering. Now, who's the author that I'm talking about? It's about Christ. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. He that sanctifieth. To be sanctified doesn't mean what the average person thinks it means. For many years, I had thought it meant to be a nice, sweet little boy. Well, my dear friend, sanctification, when it is used in connection with the Holy Spirit, has to do with the work of God in us, to make us the kind of representative He wants right down here on this earth. It is the work of the Spirit of God in the heart of those who have been redeemed, those who have been saved. However, sanctification, when it is used in connection with the person of Christ, as in this episode to the Hebrews, it's not purification. It is not a condition, but it is a position that we have in Christ. I think it's important for me to repeat this once again. When it is used here in the book of Hebrews, it's not just talking about purification. It is not a condition, but it is a position that we have in Christ. He was the just one who took the place of the unjust that he might bring us to God. And he has brought us now into the family of God. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. In the family of God, he is not ashamed to call us brothers. Think of that. Isn't that such an overwhelming term to call us little puny men right down on this earth? Christ calls each one of us brothers. Now, of course, I would not dare to call him brother, but he has brought us Christ has brought us into the family of God. He is the firstborn among many brethren. He is the head of the family and he calls us his brethren because we all become sons of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My friend, this makes it very clear that the heresy about the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man is entirely false. Let's read verse 12 now. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 12. This verse is a quotation from Psalm 22, the great psalm of the cross. The first part of Psalm 22 denotes the humiliation of Christ. And you actually are given the last seven words of Christ on the cross. 
beginning with verse 22 of the psalm, you have the exaltation of Christ. Verse 22 says of Psalm 22, listen very carefully, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. I am of the opinion that he, we could restrict this verse to the Hebrew brethren because it was written to the Jews. In the midst of the body of Christ or the church will I sing praise unto thee. The word church is congregation, the assembly, rather than the technical meaning of the word church. Now here is another quotation from the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 8 verses 17 to 18. But I am right now going to read verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 2 which is a quote from Isaiah chapter 8. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God hath given me. This verse reveals how the Holy Spirit interprets scripture. There are those today who try to give an interpretation of the prophets that eliminates any reference to Jesus Christ at all. In fact, when you read Isaiah chapter 8 verses 17 to 18, it seems that the writer is talking about the sons of Isaiah. At least that is the way I understood it. But here in verse 13, the Holy Spirit of God interprets that reference in Isaiah in such a way that it refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone today who attempts to eliminate the Lord Jesus from the prophets therefore is contradicting the interpretation that the Holy Spirit has given in the New Testament. You will remember that when the Lord Jesus came back from the dead, he said, Go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. John chapter 20 verse 17 When Jesus said, Go to my brethren, he was referring to his apostles at that particular time and they were of course all Jewish. I'm emphasizing this because I think it is very important to keep before us the ones to whom this epistle was written. This will enable us to give a correct interpretation that would lead us to a correct application to each one of our hearts. Verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. This statement emphasizes the Lord's incarnation. As the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Christ came in a way they were not expecting him to come. However, they should have known because the prophets had made it clear the way he would come to the earth the very first time. As George MacDonald put it, they were looking for a king to slay their foes and lift them high. Thou camest a little baby thing that made a woman cry. Because we were made of flesh and blood, he took upon himself flesh and blood. And he came into this world by human birth, just like you and I came into this world. That through death he might destroy him. Christ Jesus came not only through birth, his birth didn't save anyone, but through death. It is by his death he saves us, not by his birth or by his life. His death brought to us salvation. His death actually brought us life. Sounds contradicting, but that's the truth. His death brought to us salvation and deliverance from spiritual and eternal death. 
Hebrews chapter 2 verse 15 and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Listen to an interpretation of this verse by E. Scalia English. The law of God demanded and does demand death for sin. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. Satan was the cause of man's sin in the first place and even though he is a usurper, he can claim justly so in a sense that the sinner must die. He had the power, the authority to demand that every sinner should pay sin's penalty. And on account of this, all men, because all are sinners, were fearful of death and subject to bondage because of sin to serve it and thus serve Satan. This is verse 16. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. In the Old Testament, Christ took on the nature of angels. He did that when he had appeared as the angel of the Lord. And these Hebrews understood that. When Christ left heaven and came to earth, he came past the angels and came to fallen man. He took on him the seed of Abraham. He came in the line of Abraham and God had begun the preparation at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. At that time, God said that there would come the seed of the woman. You can read that in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. Then God said, he would come in the line of Abraham and a little further along we learn that he would be born in the tribe of Judah of the family of David, of the nation of Israel. He was to be born of a virgin. The Lord put up enough highway markers so that everybody, not only wise men, but everybody should have found their way to Bethlehem when Christ was born. Verse 17 Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. The Lord Jesus came down to earth in the likeness of men. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 7 we read, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. It was a real likeness to men. This likeness, Vincent tells us, is closest where the traces of the curse of sin were more apparent. In poverty, temptation, and violent and unmerited death. Christ could have been born in the palace of Caesar, but he was born in real poverty in a stable behind an inn. Why? So that he could know something of the effect of sin on humanity. Where do you see it? You see it in poverty. You see it in temptation. You see it in violent and unmerited death. That is where you see sin manifested. When Christ came to earth, he knew what real poverty was. During World War II, in El Paso, Texas, on the train, before the train pulled into the station, the conductor came by and said, Don't get off the train because there are people in the station who have been here for a week and cannot get out. They are desperate. If you leave your seat, one of them will take it and you will never get it back. Stay right where you are. I think a lot of us are familiar with that right now when we go on our trains here. We did what he said, says this writer. But once the train started its journey again, this writer of this illustration searched out the conductor and asked him what it was all about. Then he told him that many of those people were camping in the station waiting for a seat on a train. Remember that this was during the war. And many men were being shipped overseas. One young woman told the conductor that her husband had been shipped out and she was stranded. She couldn't get back to her people, 
so she was waiting in the station. He also told that a little boy had been born in that station the previous night. Imagine being born in a station. Well, my dear friend, Mary had to go to Bethlehem, although it was near the time for her baby to be born. When she got to Bethlehem, there was no room in the inn, and so the Lord Jesus Christ was born in a stable. Couldn't he sympathize with that baby born in El Paso's Union Station? Couldn't he identify himself with those who are in abject poverty? The Lord Jesus came to earth and took on a human body. He is able to sympathize with you and me, whatever our problem. He knows you and he understands you, not just because he is God, but because he became a man. He knows exactly what you and I are going through today. He came in poverty. The poverty of Jesus' family is almost unspeakable. He was born into a race that was under the heel of Rome. They were in subjection to Rome. He wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a stable. He was in all points made like unto his brethren. He became one of them. When the artist paints him, he stands out like a different person. But he was probably just like any other little boy, not any different in appearance from his playmates. He was made like unto his brethren. In emphasizing the deity of Christ, there is a danger of underestimating his humanity. Jesus Christ became a real human being. And he came out of that background. He was a root out of a dry ground. You have never had a thought nor have you ever suffered anything that he doesn't already know about. For this reason, he can be a merciful and a faithful high priest. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. It is more accurate to say to make propitiation rather than reconciliation. Christ made a mercy seat for you and me to come to. And my friend, what we need is mercy. God has a great deal of it available to us because Jesus made a mercy seat. And you can go there and get all that you need. Don't you need it? I too need it a lot. There is still plenty of it even after we seem to have used every bit of it. Christ made a mercy seat available for the sins of the people. They can get and gain forgiveness. And that is the only place where you can get God's mercy. Now what is God's mercy? God's mercy in a simplistic way, if we were to define it, it would be not getting what one deserves. All of us deserve death. All of us deserve punishment. But it's because of God's mercy that we have not received the due punishment. On the other hand, what is grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. For example, we don't deserve life. We don't deserve to be called sons of God. But God in His grace has poured out blessing upon blessing and given us sonship. That would be an act of grace. Well, I hope you've been able to identify what grace and mercy is. God bless you, my dear friend. Our Lord identifies with us and persevered in his faithfulness to the Father. And by his act, we have achieved such great salvation. Jesus is the pioneer and has opened for us the way to life with God. Now we need to live a life of gratitude for the expectation that comes from being the family of Christ. We cannot have excuses for allowing sin in our life because he expatiated us from the clutches of the evil. Also, suffering is not glorious or redemptive in itself, 
But sometimes it is to be expected when one follows God and seeks to fulfill his purposes in a world that is hostile to God. Just as he did with his son, he may allow suffering in our life to produce greater glory. Let us learn to affirm and trust in his purposes. God bless you. Thank you.